You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Are you a content creator? Are you aspiring to be a content creator? Do you want to put stuff on YouTube, maybe stream, maybe start a podcast? Well, if so, then this is going to be the episode for you. We're going to give out a bunch of advice on how to be successful with all that stuff. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Now, normally this is a Magic the Gathering podcast, but we're switching things up today because we saw a need in the community and also the community at large of creators out there. So this is the content creator advice tips and secrets episode. Yeah, so we're not going to be talking a ton about Magic cards, but we will be giving out a bunch of ways that you can be successful in content creation. Now, in researching this stuff, I wanted to say I came across a lot of content about creating content. Yeah. We research all of our episodes, everything we do, and this is no different. Um, most of it was pretty bad. A lot of it <laughs> honestly reminded me of like multi-level marketing uh, scheme yes. type. That kind of talk yeah. permeates this stuff. And a lot of the content I saw out there that's like, here's some hacks about how to create content or whatever was really from entrepreneurial type channels mm -hmm. or leadership type channels and a lot of philosophical stuff, which it's hard to talk about this and avoid that totally, but we are going to try and give some actual actionable things that you can do. Because as I was watching that stuff, I was like, it all sounds great, but like the bottom line is, what do you do? Yeah, exactly. How do you actually get it done? Yeah. And uh, my brother and I have been creating content, Phrase has been doing it since 2008. I started in 2011 and Josh has been working in the industry for 15 plus years. So we all have a lot of experience. I'm going to share that with you today. But before we get into it, this show, of course, is a podcast and it is sponsored. That's also something we might I mentioned today how to get towards something like this. We're brought to you by cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's the affiliate link you want to use if you want to buy Christmas gifts. It's that time of year. They have incredibly fast shipping. If you order soon, you're going to be able to get it But in time for the holidays. They've got tons of great board games, card games, and all other sorts of things that you can use to pass the time over the holidays. Yeah, and of course, if you're part of our Magic the Gathering audience, they have tons of that stuff too. But anybody who likes gaming of any kind, Card Kingdom's got something for you. And in fact, if you are into that gaming space at all, especially board games and things like that one of our other sponsors is ultra pro and they create all the sort of ancillary products that go along with the gaming so if you have a card that has or a game that has cards yes you're gonna want sleeves on that stuff to protect it to make sure it stays in pristine condition ultra pro makes the best sleeves on the market they're called eclipse we really do highly recommend them also if you're not into gaming at all one thing that we all do at the office because ultra pro makes play mats mm -hmm. and these are actually used in board gaming to keep uh, your cards and things off of dirty surfaces but we also use them as as a mouse pad. They're amazing mouse pads. Yeah, because you have so much real estate, so much area that your mouse can cover. I, and I can't cool go back art. to a yeah. small mouse pad now. <laughs> it's like impossible. Well, I'm like using my whole arm when I use it now. So yeah, uh, Ultra Pro obviously has tons of great stuff for games, but also if you know, you're looking in the market for a cool mouse pad with some great art on it, they've got you covered there as well. And the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Ronaldo, Ronaldo Gonzalez. Ronaldo, you rock. Thank you. Okay, so let's get into the main topic. You kind of alluded it to it earlier, Jimmy, but mm -hmm. for those people out there that may have found us... This is the type of episode they could find that they don't normally listen to our content. Do you want to just run down your resume a little bit? Yes. So I am a actor, influencer, host, YouTuber. I started doing YouTube in 2011. My brother is well-known YouTuber and director, Freddie Wong. He started it before me. I moved to LA and was like, you know what? I like this content creation thing. I came out here as an actor and decided to start doing YouTube videos because I didn't find much opportunity on the acting side. So uh, we- That was about to change. Yeah, yeah keep <laughs> that was about to change. So we started making our own opportunities and YouTube was the first place to do that. So I started off by vlogging and doing a lot of music-based content. The next year, I started a cooking show that's still going to this day called Feast of Fiction. And throughout the process, I've been acting and hosting in numerous different things for game companies like Riot Games, Wizards of the Coast, obviously, Blizzard, and we've done tons of brand deals and stuff in the gaming space. As an actor, I, I acted in a project called Video Game High School, uh, three seasons of that as the character Ted, and most recently, I'm going to be in the live-action adaptation of Mulan, Disney's Mulan, that comes out in March 2020. And Jimmy pulled his punches a little bit here. Let's be, I'm going to be real. Okay. Video Game High School, at the time it came out, biggest video, video, biggest web series of all time. Yes, We're it is talking. still, I believe, considered the most successful web series of all time. We broke multiple crowdfunding records. Millions uh, and millions of views. Yeah, it was a big, 
It was a big deal. <laughs> Rocket Jump, where you did a lot of work. We're talking 8 million subs plus. That's where uh, me and Josh actually met. Again, millions and millions of views. Yeah, acting in Disney's Milan. So Jimmy's been around the block for a lot longer even than I have uh, on the YouTube on front. The, yeah, YouTube front, sure. yeah. Um, I was a trailer editor and an editor in the movie business for over 15 years. I worked on... Projects like The Avengers, Star Wars, Pirates of the Caribbean, um, a ton of the Marvel movies. Uh, the one that gets a lot of eyebrows raised, which I never thought it would, but is Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. I did the trailer for that. People, that, uh, people tend one. to remember that trailer, which is great because it's my favorite one that I did. So I, yeah. people out there have good taste. Um, I worked at Universal, at Disney. I worked on movies for Fox and just about everything you can name. So I've been in the movie business for a long time. Yeah. Um, because of Rocket Jump and Video Game High School, I got involved in the YouTube space. And then Jimmy and I started this channel. Um, uh, the Command Zone channel focused on gaming and Magic the Gathering uh, about years five years five ago years, now. Yeah. And uh, our sort of big breakout under that banner was uh, our web series called Game Nights, yep. which is, again, a... Well, we average around a million views per episode now. Um, Tons of special guests. We recently yep. had Brandon Sanderson, who's a really well-known uh, fantasy and, yeah, fantasy author. Best-selling author. Uh, we've got NFL players. We've had big people in the streaming gaming space like Day9, yep. Ashley Birch, people like that. A lot of pros for Magic. So Josh is pulling his punches as well. Game Nights was his baby and decided that, you know what, let's take our contents to the next level. And Josh actually stopped editing trailers and decided to just do freelance Pro bono work. I know you don't love saying it, but it's how he got introduced to the YouTube world because he was curious and he said, you know what? I think there is something here. I think there's a lot of potential for something bigger. And so you went and found the, your careers that you thought were at the top of their game. And Freddie happened to be one of them. And that's where we met, started playing Magic. And then it all sort of spiraled from there. So big props to Josh for taking a big risk. And I think it's paid off. Uh, I, I'd say it has. So anyway, obviously we uh, have been fairly successful, I'd say, in this space, in the content creator space. But I do want to say we're not the end-all be-all. We have mm -hmm. our expertise from our angle and our perspective. Our discussion today about all of this stuff is not going to be equally applied to everyone because everyone's coming from a different position and creativity just doesn't work that way. <laughs> it, That's true. Part of what makes creativity so awesome and is the uniqueness of the individual creating the thing mm -hmm. and that creates unique circumstances which are necessitated basically to create the content because you want it to be unique to you. So we're going to try and give our perspectives, what we think is right. Uh, and we may say it in sort of an authoritative tone as far as like, this is the way, what I believe, but it's not going to be uh, applicable one for one to every single person out there. So yeah. disclaimer at the start. All right, the show's going to be split into two parts. The first part, we're going to be talking a lot and tackling a lot of the most frequently asked questions. And... Uh, really from beginning content creators. Yeah, people yeah. that may have not started yet or just started a channel or are curious about starting a channel, which uh, we found that are many, many of you out we there. We get asked all the time. Yeah, and we don't doubt it. Uh, I We were all the same way at some point. The thirst is real and it's a really fun journey. So that's going to be the first part of the, of the podcast. Part two, the second half, will be aimed more towards people who are farther along on that journey. So established creators or people that are already doing stuff in the YouTube space, streaming space, mm -hmm. making a podcast or something, but maybe are feeling like they've plateaued or haven't been as successful as they wish they would. So we're hoping we can help both groups out. Yep. And I think advice in both categories will be helpful to people in either category, but one will be more aimed at you than the other, maybe. And we consider all of you our peers because you're joining us on this content creation journey. All okay. right. Let's start with advice for quote unquote beginners, uh, people that are just starting out or thinking about starting out. There's a lot of people out there who would like to try it and they're a little bit nervous about it or want a lot of questions answered. And so we're hoping that we can answer some of them. By far, the most frequently asked question from the group of beginning content creators is what microphone, software, camera, or other piece of equipment should I get? Yes. What do I need to do this? And oftentimes, you know, they watch YouTube videos. They're wondering what kind of camera do you use? What microphone is that? Yeah. Or they'll see something and not even realize that audio is a part of it. And realize, right. Oh, do I need this as well? Do I need some fancy editing software? Yada, yada, yada. Basic answer, don't worry about it too much. That's the first thing and the main takeaway you should have. We're going to give you some answers to those questions because I don't like just saying like, we're not going to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think people by and large, would you agree, Jimmy, just worry about like what piece of tech do I need way too much? 100%. And I understand that there are a lot of tech heads out there, people that love going into this sort of stuff. Um, but it's akin to basically saying, you know what? 
I'm giving myself, a con- and, and I find this too a lot of times, people ask these questions over and over again and not be satisfied with an answer or never take the dive because it makes it easier for them when they eventually don't do it. Like, oh, well, I didn't get the camera I needed, so I can't film this thing. Again. Yes, yes. Which is very it, debilitating. To me, it's akin to like, I'm going to, I joined a membership at a, a gym and I'm going to go to the gym. Jimmy, I know you go to the gym a lot. What kind of dumbbells should I use? <laughs> yeah. What kind of gloves should I wear? Listen, yeah. it's not that that's completely unimportant, but that's not the important part of it. The important part of it is going in and lifting heavy stuff. Yeah, and then you'll get to lift heavier stuff, yeah. and your form will get better, and eventually you'll be a pro weightlifter that everyone hates at the gym. No, just <laughs> kidding. Um, honestly, yeah, there are many, many different ways to make a video. We do it every day if we don't, you know, not by not realizing, by filming stuff on our phone. And honestly, the phone cameras that we have are so great these days. They're better than cameras that I could have bought when we first started making videos on YouTube. By so, far. By far, yeah. So don't let technological things be your limitation. Okay. Also, I want to say Google is your friend. There are a thousand videos on what kind of equipment you should use. There's a ton of tutorials and articles. Yeah. Obviously, it's you know, you're going to have to do some parsing and sifting through. But if you hear three or four different videos mention the same camera, the same microphone, you can be pretty well... Uh, pretty certain that that works, yeah. Yeah, at least on some level, especially starting out. Yeah, um, and there's so many vloggers out there. And if you just look up best vlogging camera and sort by more of the recent dates, you'll see, even if you buy a camera from two years ago that was a vlogging camera, it's still going to be just fine enough. You're not we're not, you're not going to be going out there making a Hollywood movie anytime soon. Right. You're actually just learning to start off. And so having something that is more, quote unquote, starter piece of equipment isn't going to hurt you in the long run in a lot of cases what we're using is not actually what i would tell you to use because it's just a little bit too far along you should use something that's a little bit more starter material and work up to it i also like the idea of googling and using finding tutorials because it puts you in this mindset that you're going to need to be a content creator which is you got to be a problem solver you got to be able to research things and find it out on your own and so that's this is a, a time to start doing that so yeah but having, we do appreciate people that ask because it yeah. gives us a reason to give an answer and i will also say this i use the same camera body and lens that i bought in 2011 all the way to 2017 and there was never a single time that anyone commented being like why is your camera quality like this because it, it looks like crap good yeah, enough crap. Yeah. and that was and it was more important was the content that i was making all right having said all of this we're going to tell you what we use so microphones the ones right in front of us here are sure sm7b's yes these are considered the podcast classics you'll see these on the joe rogan podcast you'll see them pretty much in any major podcast also in studios and radios and stuff this is a, a go-to microphone for a lot of people uh, unfortunately it's not very cheap right it's it's they're a little on the expensive side some cheaper options and stuff i i used when we were first starting mm-hmm. out and i still will use these on occasion if we're traveling so you i don't want to bring this thing yeah. with me you know when we go to europe or something I, I need something smaller more compact also if i lose it i don't want to lose that much money yeah so, and you also need to these don't just connect straight to a computer either. right you need like another recording device so yeah. it, it's a whole bunch of equipment so something that you could easily use and like i said i will still sometimes use on our show is the blue yeti yep which is fairly cheap about a hundred bucks a little bit less you can find them on sale they're perfectly fine a lot of big podcasts that you know have used blue yeti Mm -hmm. maybe you need like a little pop filter in front of it is about all i would say even a snowball yeti which is even cheaper maybe like 50 bucks or cheaper than that uh if i'm really really like i don't think we're going to record anything then i'll just grab that and put it in my bag because it's smaller yeah just in case um and that will work fine too and they're both usb as well uh blue makes a lot of the microphones that you can just put straight into your computer and then yep. you just you can use it any well, tons of free programs just to record the audio yeah audacity is the program that we would say is probably the best sort of cheap free easy to get a hold of and if uh, you are on a mac then you have tons of options yes for sure yeah uh a couple of things to make your audio quality better that aren't microphone based. So one is I would look online for some tutorials, articles, whatever on audio compression and then audio EQ equalization. Those two things, just if you learn the very basics of it will help your audio quality a lot. I think there's a tendency to overdo the compression. 100%. Be careful about that. Yeah. So just put a teeny bit of compression on. Don't put a lot. Yeah, and you can look up like best, and a lot of the compressors in programs will have settings for like podcasting too. Yep. So you can just straight put a, uh, a preset on. Think of it as like salting a dish at the end of cooking it. You want to put a little bit of salt to bring out the taste. If you put too much salt in, then it's not going to taste good. It's going to taste over too much. And you'll hear it sometimes. It's like, it's all one like loudness. Sounds very computery. Sounds very computery, yeah. And the EQ is the same thing you're using the eq to balance out the highs and the lows so if you're if it's too bassy it's very thuddy you're going to try to drop the eq to sort of make it sound more natural and human 
it's very easy to find tutorials on both that stuff but i like what you said when you're starting out don't get into the weeds on that stuff a yeah. preset is great if they've got a podcast preset set it to that and just call it good for a while and they'll sound great trust me and, yeah. and use your own ears and have other people listen to it too peer review very important uh, another big thing that's easy to do, doesn't cost a lot of money, is soundproofing the room you're in uh, in some way. And you, it doesn't have to be crazy. So we'll probably show a, a picture here of the room that we're in. We've got about half of it with a bunch of foam on the wall. And then if you're in a smaller room, you can do less of that. But the, the big thing is hard square surfaces are going to bounce the sound around a lot and yeah. create a lot of echo. And so you want soft and not square. Even if you can just create a corner of the room that's diagonal to the others. It'll dampen the sound and and lower the amount of echo in the room. Yeah, and you put cons you can put some pillows into it. You know when you yell into an open space, you hear it come back at you. But if you put a pillow in front of your face and yell, it won't because the sound is hitting something and not bouncing back super hard. So that's what the re sound reflections are all about. Another thing you do if you're not doing video, if it's audio only, you can create a mini sound booth, which is basically just foam in a cardboard box. Yeah, and then you put the mic inside of that cardboard box and just speak into that mic and you've created a, a small environment that is soundproof yeah and that will make your audio sound great so if you're audio only that's a really easy way i used to do it with pillows not yeah, even you mean you you were still building forts in your adulthood yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we're at a if i have to record and we're remote and when i'm at a hotel room i'll just take the pillows maybe the sheets and just yeah. create a little box and put the mic in there and no one can even tell the difference makes a huge difference too yeah. um and proximity is really important so every microphone is going to sound different and we'll give a sort of a mini test Let's, here yeah if we're talking from back here we're already adding a compressor onto our audio to make it sound better but this is a much bigger difference talking from you know a foot away from the microphone than if we're right up on the microphone you can hear a lot more of the voice a lot more of the actual you know the parts of the word and the syllabuses and all that stuff and it's just going to sound better yeah uh, for instance i'm going to count to 10 and as i get towards 10 i'll go closer to the mic so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten how much better does 10 sound than one a lot better yeah and and it's a small difference and that, a lot of times it's just like it's a something that you need to learn. So it's the same as in like when you go running, your f running form gets better. The more you start talking into a mic, the more you'll know that if you're gonna like have a huge laugh, maybe you should back up a little bit for the laugh, but come right back for the next you know thing you're gonna say. But in general, be close to your microphones. Now remember, this all depends on exactly what you're doing. So with these specific mics, we wanna be right on top of them. We might use totally different mics for like our gameplay web series. We have wireless mics, boom mic hang mm -hmm. hanging from the ceiling. You're gonna have to look up the specifics based on what you're doing, but yeah, in, if you have multiple people, you might want the mic in the middle of you on the table so that you can both speak into it from an equal distance. But it, even if you're doing that in general, I've see, I've heard a lot of like content and podcasts and whatnot where they interview somebody and it's be like, listen, just have everybody lean close to the mic at least. Yeah. And then it'll make it a lot better. A lot, a lot better. All right. Next is cameras. Uh, what cameras do we use, Jimmy? So the cameras that we have been using now for the past four years are Canon C100s. Uh, and the camera that we have for the overhead of the table when we play for game nights is a Canon XC10, which films on 4K. And none of these include the price of a lens or a memory card. And both of those are also very important to, you know, getting the stuff off of your cards and onto your computer. Yeah, make sure you factor in lens if the camera doesn't come with a lens that you're going to use and factor in the memory cards. On the Canon XC10, we did not think the memory cards uh, were going to be as expensive as they were because it says it can shoot on an SD card, but it actually can't shoot 4K on an SD card. So you have to get another kind of card, which yeah. costs like $1,500 per card. So that can really bite you. Make sure you research that stuff. But in general, those are good cameras, but again, they're not cheap. Yep. You can also just use a regular DSLR, like a Canon 60, 70D, or the Canon Rebel series. That's like the cheapest body you can get, and the sensor is great, and it's just up to the nice lens you have on top of it that really makes a difference. Uh, we should explain the difference. So there's two kinds of cameras basically used for content creation like this. There are DSLRs, yep. which is digital single lens, lens reflux. reflux. I don't know. I don't know what they are. I, I think just it's say reflux. DSLR. Yeah. The ones that look like cameras. That they're basically what would used to be still cameras, like fancy still cameras, but they do have a video option. But the thing about DSLRs are they cannot record for more than 30 minutes. Yeah. So after, th uh, if you want to take a clip at about somewhere around 25 to 27 minutes, it'll just stop. And so that's not useful for certain kinds of content. Like for instance, this podcast is going to be over that length. So we don't want a camera that's just going to turn itself off yeah. 25 minutes in. So, But when we first started doing it, we did. We had to stop and then hit the record button again. So that was just a huge pain in the butt. And you may have to do that. And that's a workaround and it's not the worst in the short term. Uh, but there are uh, a 
category of cameras that are referred to as camcorders, and that's what we are using, and those will record for a much longer period of time. Yeah. They're meant to record video. They're not still cameras that have sort of been repurposed. Yep. Um, you can also just use your phone. And if you are going to record on your phone, let's say you got the new iPhone or you got the new Pixel or whatever it is, just make sure you mount it on something that so it's stable. You know, like you can buy a clamp from Amazon to even have it look down at a table, look at you, and it'll cost you, you know, like 15 bucks, right? Really cheap, but it ends up being great. And phones also have really good audio recording and stuff too. So that's another option as well. So don't limit yourself thinking you look up these cameras and go, oh, I can't afford that. You have something in your pocket that might be just as good. The for, iPhone for camera now. video cameras now are crazy yeah like, they're really good how good they are so with the right lighting and the and the, like you said the right setup to hold the camera and everything you can do a lot with your phone um again i would find some tutorials online video tutorials basic color correction something that can be very easy to do again same with the audio compression don't mm -hmm. overdo it don't go crazy but a lot of times there's presets or very simple settings that you can do to just help out your color yes and it makes a big difference too um all, oftentimes cameras on your phones will just automatically color the footage too so that'll look nice um learn how to frame shots learn how to give appropriate headroom and also you know the rule of thirds is something that every photographer and every cinematographer learns so you can just look this stuff up online and i'll tell you this is how you should frame a shot and it's not going to look good if josh and i were both down here yeah it's also and not going to look good if we're like yeah all, <laughs> all the way up here so so learn how to do that stuff and that'll make a huge difference and if you record too wide learn how to crop in a little bit to just make it look better yeah, in general, we're in the era where you want to record slightly wider than you think because it's easier to punch in in your ed, uh, in your editing mm -hmm. program. It's also, impossible to punch out. <laughs> it's, yeah, you if, can't if, pull if, out. There's no information off the screen. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is framing will change based on what kind of shot it is. So a wide shot, yeah. you'll want different amounts of headroom than a close-up shot. If you just pay attention to framing while you're watching like TV and stuff, it'll teach you a lot too but tutorials will help you. Um, another thing you might want to look up is depth of field. So mm -hmm. one of the ways that sort of people think of as production quality or shots that look beautiful is really just focus and focal length. So a lot of times you'll have a shot of something and in the background is sort of fuzzy, right? Because they're really focused on the subject. That's depth of field and a way to sort of simulate production quality. Like the brain will just say like, that looks good. Oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, that person knows what they're doing. So look up depth of field. Uh, and in general, like right now our camera is about five feet away from us. We don't want to use the camera audio because it's too far and it's the same idea as we're not close to our microphone so if you're doing something like a podcast or a tutorial or even just streaming you want to make sure that you have a microphone that you can sync up with your audio and it's closer to you so that it sounds better and not like you're screaming at something in a dimly lit corridor that will definitely like exacerbate echo problems and, and yeah. stuff like that uh yeah you you almost always want to be recording your audio separately than your video again that's not, it's not always, it's just very often. How about that? Yep. All right, let's talk about software. This is the other thing people ask us about. What editing program do you, you use? Um, what we use on the show is Adobe Premiere Pro. We also use a lot of Photoshop, uh, a lot of After Effects, a little bit of Cinema 4D. Um, Audacity is what we use to use to record our audio. Uh, sometimes we still do. Um, we started using a program called Alphonic recently to balance the audio. Yeah, but uh, really Adobe Premiere Pro we use for 90% of this stuff. Yeah, I, I would say that Premiere Pro is the go-to if you're looking to really start editing and learning more about that process. It's it's you, almost every single person in the world uses it at this point for YouTubers. Um, but there are people that just use, for instance, Mitch from the Commander's Quarters uses iMovie. Yep. And I know I Justine, one of the biggest YouTubers, used iMovie for a long, long time. And her videos were no worse for it. They were, in fact, oftentimes better because they had better presets or it was easier to work with. So just find the thing. What do you always say about the hammer and the nail? Right. I say that all editing programs are basically just a hammer. Yeah. And like, yeah, I'm sure like real Mastercraft uh, carpenters have a hammer they prefer over another. But in general, any hammer is going to hammer down a nail. Yeah. So what editing program you're using like like you just said i justine used iMovie for a long time mitch from the commander's quarters he had 100,000 subs within a year is still using iMovie so there are tons of free stuff there are tons of hammers out there just choose one it's going to work for you and 
on, I think people th- get worried. I'm going to learn to use this hammer. And then if I need to <laughs> use this other hammer, I I'm won't screwed. know how to hammer down the nail. No, you'll be fine. You're going to pick up this other hammer and it's going to feel slightly weird because the grip will be a little different and you're going to hit the nail twice and you'll be like, oh, it's just a hammer. Yeah, it's, it does the same yeah. thing. Yeah, I just need to learn how to kind of hold it a little differently. <laughs> um, I did want to say there's more to editing than just knowing what buttons to push and it, there are a lot of tutorials out there to teach you about editing and what works and why. And I would mm-hmm. take some time to learn that just like framing a shot. I think too often editing is like, oh, I'm going to cut from this to this and what do I need to learn about it? But there are philosophies and reasons behind why you cut, when you cut, how you cut. And that is definitely worth learning. So yep. look that stuff up. And there is videos from master editors of movies in Hollywood that will walk through their process and stuff too. It's all out there. People like to teach. All right. A couple of little bullet points that didn't fit into the section, but I thought were, you know, we should bring up once you get all your equipment and you have whatever you're going to use it's not time to shoot the thing yet yeah it's time to practice with your equipment so that you know how it works so that you can get ready to shoot the thing yeah how are your settings are you uh making sure you're setting your iso and stuff to the right stuff do you have the best lighting for your your people are you making sure that when you're recording your audio you're putting headphones on and listening back to what you recorded so you know the difference between standing here or here or here what it sounds like with two people talking all that stuff you got to test out otherwise you're going to spend an hour recording play it back and realize you have to do it again and you might have lost something like what if your guest went home you don't have access to them what if you know some sort of prop that you rented or whatever is now gone do all this stuff early on in the process when there's no pressure on you. I'm going to record only two minutes of me speaking, bring it back in and listen to it and say, oh, here's what I learned from that process. So definitely practice with your equipment. Uh, This is something you said at the very start that's just super true. Yeah, don't get stuck in the weeds. Don't find reasons to not do the thing you want to do because you couldn't get the right equipment or you, you know, didn't feel ready enough yet. Like, these are all things that you can accomplish and all of us can accomplish with the equipment that we have around us. And honestly, maybe you don't have the right phone for it, but your friend does. Hey, can I borrow your phone for a couple hours on Saturday? Or do, hey, do you want to help me film something? Even better, collaborate with someone, learn to do something together. Um, There's a lot of different things that you can do to make the thing happen and honestly as is with most things in life if you want something more than someone else you're gonna get it and that's how you get stuff to be made on youtube and online and content in general you just need to really want it and if you really want something you're not gonna let an excuse get in your way to stop you from doing it yeah don't get lost in the technical parts of it what you're shooting what you're saying is way more important than what's being used to shoot or record it you will find the tools to shoot or record the thing yeah Okay, Uh, let's go to the next point here, which is, or the next question we get a lot, which is, I have an insert idea here. I want to do this. For my content. Is it a good idea? How would we know? Yeah, I mean, we can look at it and give our base, like, gut reaction, being like, yeah, sounds good. Or like, the world is full of people whose ideas are home run ideas, and they pitched it 99 million times, and everybody said that's a horrible idea. Yeah, but it could still be an amazing idea. Yeah. Steve Jobs was fired from Apple before he came back and changed the company and the world, right? So sometimes your vision may not match up with what other people think. The best way to know if you're a good idea is whether or not you are really passionate and really believe in it. That's That, to me, connotes a good idea because you really do believe in it, and that means you're going to do a good job putting it forth, too. I think the thing to know here and realize is that the need to ask that question is really just a lack of confidence. And what you're trying hopefully to do is get a lot of people to tell you that's a great idea, which will give you the confidence to try and do it. You don't need that affirmation. And honestly, like some of the greatest ideas in human history look nuts on the surface. So no one can tell you if an idea is good. However, what I will say is the biggest hurdle or the biggest thing I say about most ideas, because I don't like to judge when people ask me whether the idea is good because I'm no one can tell you that. Yeah. But I can judge if the idea is maybe overambitious, hard to pull off. Narrow your idea to some to, to bite-sized pieces, manageable, something you can actually execute and do. Some ideas are like, listen, that's a great place to try and get to, but you got to <laughs> figure out where you're going to start. Yeah. Yeah, you can't come out the gates as Steven Spielberg. You can't come out the gates as an, as a Josh Lee Kwai. You you have to put in the hours and the time to really refine your craft and what you're doing to better actualize your ideas in the future. So don't give yourself a gargantuan task because that's also a great way to stop making content is putting something forward that's so hard and requires so much work that by the time you're halfway done with it or just done with it or couldn't even complete it, you're just you've lost interest. If you walk into that gym and you try and pick up the 90 pound dumbbells and you're like, well, why can't I lift these things? So you've got to start with the 20 pound ones first for a while. Exactly. And work your way there. Okay. 
The, the next question we get a lot is, should I start out solo or try to get a partner to work together on a channel with me? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I, I love working with people. I think the name of the game of doing YouTube stuff from the beginning was always about collaborating and finding other people to work with. That being said, everyone's different. You may be a lone wolf type person that needs to have absolute control over their stuff. And maybe that's how you need to start. But that might also change in a few years when you realize you want to do bigger stuff and need to work with more people. So it's very flexible. Everyone's a different human being at the end of the day. I think a message that's going to permeate all this advice we're giving is you need to sort of know yourself, know your strengths. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and so, like you said, I love what you said there, which is that everybody's different. And part of what makes creativity great is that you're going to create a different painting than I would ever paint. And our friend Rob would paint something crazy that we would never even think of. Yeah. And that's why art is awesome. So you, this is a question no one can answer for you. Again, if you feel you need that support structure or whatever, maybe you want a partner, but down the line, you know, are you the type of person that wants complete control of everything that you do? Well, that, the partner's not going to necessarily give you that. Yeah. Um, so you just got to think along those angles. But definitely be open to it, right? I think like saying like, I don't need a partner. I'm going to do this all myself can also be foolhardy in the same yeah. way. And you might learn that lesson. It might be a very important moment for you. But at the same time, when, you know, for me, when I started working and uh, doing videos for myself, I asked for a lot of help, but I didn't necessarily partner with someone. And that was all I needed at the time. Later on, it was like, you know what? I have a, this idea is too big to do myself. I need someone else to help keep me accountable and to help keep them accountable. So yeah, let's work with this person. You know, so just really let it play itself out and play to you what you're interested in and learn the lessons as they come along. Uh, one piece of advice I did have here is we live in this digital era and we can cross great distances and all kinds of cool things and opportunities happen because of that. But if possible, I would partner with someone that you don't have to work with remotely. Being yeah. in the same space as someone creatively when you're working, it's amazing how much of an advantage that is over having to deal with a large amount of distance. It seems like it wouldn't be, but there's just so much about creativity that is conveyed with nonverbals and things like that. Yeah. That just, we've just found like anybody we hire, anybody we work with, if they're in the same room with us, the outcome is so much different than if they're not. Yeah. And it's also like, Hey, I have a question. All right. Well, you could just turn around and ask the person instead of texting them. What if the person's not doing something that allows them to text you back at the time, then you lose so much time and the flow of it. So yeah, there is, it is really important to be, if you can do it close to the people that are working with you. Sometimes even just like making sure you're on a FaceTime call the whole time would also be helpful. You know, there, there are ways of getting around it. Definitely don't let it be a hurdle if that's it yeah if you can do it is important like that that shouldn't be the main hurdle yeah um okay the next cool question we got is what are the main things to focus on if you have a limited budget so the i think the the, the clear thing i would say is audio quality mm -hmm. over video quality if your stuff sounds good but looks bad you might be okay if it looks bad if it looks good but sounds bad you're probably in big trouble and if it looks bad and sounds bad right then, well you but need if, to fix one of them <laughs> but if 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 it's just crackly and i can't understand what's being said it doesn't really even matter what i'm looking at yeah that's true whereas if i'm looking at something and it's not the best but i can clearly understand it i can still watch yeah and i think that's also something that you know a lot of different things throw us off when we watch videos and audio quality is one that I think is pretty universal. If something sounds bad or is unpleasant to listen to, if you're watching it, you can just look at the different screen, pull out your phone and do whatever. But if you're listening to something, it, you have to listen to it. And so I would say like, like, don't make your content good for background listening necessarily, but make sure that it can be listened to in the background, if that makes sense. Uh, and I would also say, assuming that budget means money, uh -huh. um, that the real answer is of what you should focus on if you have a limited budget is your ideas. There's an old saying in Hollywood that film costs a lot, but paper costs nearly nothing. Right. To just sit there and write something down and print it out or do whatever it is that is almost free. It's way cheaper than when you're rolling cameras. You don't want to be figuring out, you know, and finalizing your idea at that point. Um, and so if you're the type of person like I have limited money or I have limited time or both, and those, the two things are often related. <laughs> um, then spend more time on your idea before you start going might be the way to go. I, yeah. This is dangerous advice to give because there's a lot of paralysis by analysis. A lot of people mm -hmm. like looking for excuses, even though they don't know they are. That, and you alluded to that by saying that um, when you ask a lot of the technical questions, what camera should I buy, whatever, well, I can't afford that. That's kind of another excuse that you're throwing in your path. 
sort of on purpose to make it harder for you to start making your content. Yeah. So even, I, if it's, even if you don't realize you're doing it, you're doing it for a reason that makes it easier for you to, you know, accept the outcome if it doesn't go in the full way you wanted in the originally kind of thing. So I don't want paralysis by analysis, but I also don't want jump, jumping in head first without looking necessarily. So mm -hmm. think about your idea, flesh it out, spend time on it. Don't just necessarily shoot the first incarnation of the idea you have, refine it. But if I had to fall on the side of once my left hand is paralysis by analysis, <laughs> my right hand is jumping in head first without thinking, jump in head first without thinking is going to be better than paralysis by analysis. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like an improv in acting. They, I would much rather have, if I was a director, have an actor do too much rather than not enough because it's easier to pull someone back in from doing too much. And push them forward. Yeah. Again. Also, like setting a goal is really healthy. Let's say that it's January and you're like, I have a project that by the end of this year, right? I'm not talking about tomorrow, next week, next month. Give it a long-term goal. By the end of this year, I want to have a channel and I want to get 200 subscribers on it. And it's going to be about something that I'm really genuinely interested in. That gives you an entire year and a deadline to hit so that you know, okay, okay, if I really want to do this by the six month mark, I got to make sure I have all my ducks in a row, all this stuff figured out, testing it, and then I can start releasing stuff. This is my plan for marketing, yada, yada. If you just say like, by next month, I want to do something, that those four weeks are going to pass by like that. And you're not going to, and you're going to realize that how fast it's gone by. And you've just been like, oh, well, I didn't actually accomplish my goal. Set a realistic goal at a longer time period. And you'll find that you can work towards it much more efficiently. Uh, and one thing I want to say that's sort of re related to this as far as honing your idea uh, and saving money is ha have a take, have an opinion, find your voice. And I think people throw out that find your voice thing a lot. Mm -hmm. Look for your voice, like search around for it, try stuff, figure out what your voice is going to be. I think people say find your voice and then people don't go about trying to look for it. They just yeah. sort of start saying stuff and go, I guess that's my voice. Yeah, right. You, you can find it. You can hone it. You can figure out what it is. Uh, we were working on something the other day and I was working with one of our editors and we were refining an idea and he had a really good first idea and we looked, I looked at it and he was like, okay, when are we going to shoot it? And I go, hold on. The idea is good, but it can be great. Let's leave some time for those aha moments in the shower. Yeah. You know, and we both came back the next day and I was like, you know, I thought of this, let's add this. And he was like, I thought of this. I had, well, if we didn't give time to, for those little moments, we wouldn't have added the two or three little four different things that really push your content from good to awesome. Yeah. It's like uh, cooking a soup. The longer you let the bones marinate or whatever it is, the better broth, it yeah, it's going to taste better over time. But you overcook it, it's going to taste like poop. Okay. Let's talk about really quickly some com common mistakes of beginning creators. Uh, just a couple of bu bullet points here. And this is something we see in the gaming space a lot. Please don't get offended. Don't use uh, what we like to call... We call it nerd voice. Nerd voice. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to try and impersonate it, but you know what it is. It's muttering, Understated, uh, not, really. not much energy. Okay. We're impersonating it now. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's a way to talk about it without impersonating. It's talking slowly. It's not... It, yeah. Maybe flat affect. Yeah. It kind of just... It's, it doesn't have much life to it, you know, but I really enjoyed the movie. I thought Joker was uh, a statement, you know? It's like, what? What are you saying? Yeah, Joker was awesome. It was a little bit crazy, and I didn't get this part, and, like, that's how you speak when you're in front of a microphone. I didn't, didn't see Joker, by the way, so I don't Yeah, know I haven't seen it either. <laughs> Neither of them They're seen making it. a second one, and it made a ton of money, but, like, the amount of emotion and the amount of inflection and the animation in your voice, you're on camera. You yeah. are performing. Make sure that you're aware of that. That doesn't mean you have to be over the top crazy like we just were. There are tons of people that get away with their own voice mm -hmm. being a little bit different. But in general, you have to know you're on camera and affect your voice and how you're speaking. Watch like hosts on TV. Some of them might overdo it. But watch the whole spectrum. The people that sell you stuff on those channels all the way to sign Ryan Seacrest on, you know, the, the drop the, the, the whatever, holiday ball or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. You know? New Year's Rock and Eve. <laughs> yeah. All the way to, you know, your John and Hank Greens on YouTube. Look at the way they address the camera, that they're intently focused on the, per the person and the people they're talking to. And that way, when you're watching it, you feel brought in by the content, too. It's, it's not like it's not magic. It, it really is just if you are genuinely talking to someone and you're excited and you have a message to say and you've thought it through and you're succinct and distinct and clear, it's going to be much better than sort of muttering it out and just nervously getting the message out. And just like with the equipment, practice it, listen to it, do it a couple times, listen to yourself. Show I, it to friends, show it to your mom yep. and dad, show it to people that know you really well and people that don't. I spent a long time just getting rid of my us, which I still say sometimes, but I cut down on them by 90% what they were when we first started the show. Yeah, I try to just never have a moment where I just stop 
and there's a lot of dead space i can't even let you have the dead space yeah well, as i feel you start to come down to dead space my uh, voice just starts going yeah yeah and that's a part of the collaboration that josh and i've had and i've had too where it's like i know i'm reaching the end of my sentence and talk so i'm gonna sort of end it in a way that leads it off right and right. like ask a question and like you know these are all just small things that you pick up over time uh the last one i want to say is specifically for podcasters and this is a thing i've noticed happens a lot <laughs> so i'm going to give you this advice this one's for free stop telling your life story early on in your episodes. I think it was until episode 60 something that we did our like breakdown of who we are. If you listen to our first like 50 episodes, here's something we never ever did. So how are you doing today, Jimmy? Oh, great. Um, How'd yeah, your week go? It was pretty good. Anything yeah. exciting happen? Uh, no. Well, my dog escaped from its crate and That's it crazy, ran around dude. the room. Oh, again? Like, no yeah. way. Th listen, <laughs> here's the thing. A, you're not that interesting. I'm sorry. We, we're not either. Yeah, that story was boring. <laughs> B, you're early on in your podcast career. They don't know you yet. Yeah. Get to your topic. Whatever the reason is that you're creating the podcast for, whatever the title of the episode is, get to it. Start talking about it. Listen, on episode 50, 60, 70, somewhere in there, they've gotten to know you. You've dropped in little anecdotes about your life and things mm -hmm. that are happening or have happened to you because that's natural over conversing with other people for hours and on end over multiple years. People are started asking you too. Like, yeah. hey, that's so cool. You know, you mentioned this. How did you get started in that kind right. of thing? But it's like as if the first time you met somebody, like your waiter just started telling you their life story. That's not what you're there for. You're, just let me put in my food order. Now, if you yeah. come back to that restaurant every day for seven weeks by the end of that you're going to be like hey how's your kid oh how yeah, how yeah, the yeah. how the dance recital go but you wouldn't be doing that on the first day that's just weird so stop telling your <laughs> life story i have a a rule when i go guest on a podcast have i told you this no i don't think so okay so we get asked to guest on magic related podcasts mostly mm -hmm. um quite often and the first thing i say is okay i'll do it but there's a question that you're not allowed i'm not going to answer it you can't ask me this question if i come on your podcast it's when did i start magic and why yeah because no one cares. It's boring. I'm boring telling the story about myself. That's just, everybody asks that question. It's on everything. Let's just not talk about that. And people are like, oh, okay, yeah, let's not do that. Um, let's focus on the thing we brought you on for. Yeah, let's talk yeah. about the topic. We're going to get a little deeper into the weeds here. And this is still really important information for someone that's starting out to sort of see where things might advance to or get to. Um, and this is more addressed to anyone else that's out there right now, grinding, trying to get their way up there, trying to figure out what their path is and, and how they're going to align with it and how they're going to get there. I think a lot of creators, they start out and they do a lot of the stuff we said and they get some success early and then you know they get into i i don't know what the number would be it's going to be different for different things that you're talking mm -hmm. about or different niches that you're in but you get into twenty thousand subs and you just hit this wall and it just you're in molasses and it feels like you're not growing as much as you were or you know you had this goal to reach a hundred thousand or a million or whatever it was and it, it feels like you're not progressing anymore. You just plateaued. And yeah, so and life starts getting in the way. Maybe your interest wanes and a couple of things start adding up. And all of a sudden you have another excuse as to why you can't keep going. So by far the most asked question from established content creators that we get is how should I promote my content? How should I market my channel? How do I get people? Basically, how do I get people to check out my stuff? Yeah. Um, this is a very common question because I think we are living in a world where numbers and views and likes and shares are the metrics that which on which we determine success. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to get someone like Martin Scorsese going out there making a movie and going, man, I really hope a lot of people watch this movie. In fact, you'll notice with most major creative experiences in Hollywood, the marketing is completely separate from the directing and the creative and what comes and what makes the movie. And there's a good reason for that. They don't need to necessarily be intertwined to make something successful because that's the way that we deem success is different in everyone's eyes. I mean, having come from the marketing arm of major studios, in a lot of movies, the filmmakers, and that's how we refer to them in the yeah. marketing, is like the filmmakers are not very involved in the marketing process. They might have a say here and there, but in general, they're too close. They knew too much about other aspects of the movie that aren't that they'll bring that into the marketing, but it's actually not very useful and it can derail you. And so the separation is actually natural and nice. Um, first thing I want to say before tackling this question, because we are going to give you some advice on how to promote things, because at the start, we, I said I was mad because <laughs> I listen to these things and they don't tell you anything. They just, talk, <laughs> they just talk around stuff. So we'll give you some actionable, try these things. But I don't think you should worry about this as much as you think you should. Promoting your channel is 
it is important you can do it, but you're probably worrying about it too much and not worrying enough about how good your content is. Um, we'll get into that a little more later, but take, we're going to give you some advice, but um, my main advice with all of it is don't worry about it as much as you think you should. So yeah. if you make better content, you'll find that it's going to fuel everything else. The marketing and the promotion of it and the sharing of it is going to come naturally the more you can invest into the actual content and making it as good as you can. All right, so one of the first things you can do, and I think a lot of people do do this and have tried it, which is invite other creators onto your channel, onto your show, onto your podcast, onto your stream, basically collaborate with other creators. Um, this can help you out. It can be a way for their audience to get exposed to your stuff, and that's mainly what you're going for. So if it was us, we might try and find the professor from Tulare Community College to come on our show because he has a large audience. He's been on our show many times, not just for that reason. Also, he's our friend, but that does help. Because uh, fans love him. Yeah, he's going to tweet out, and people that like him are going to be like, oh, I'll check that out because I like him, and they may not have heard of our show before, in which case they're exposed to our show, and they might go... Hey, that Jimmy and Josh, they're not so bad. I'll check out some of their other stuff. You could even be like, oh, I know those guys. I'm not subscribed to them. But I will watch this episode with the professor because I love him so much. Yep. And, you know, that could spiral into like, oh, look at this recommended video on the side of my thing. You, we have no control over what's get, what gets recommended. Right. But you, that might be a, a better way for someone to market themselves, to get marketed into more of our content or whatever it is. A question that I get a lot is, okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense. How do I collab with someone? How do I reach out to them? How do I get them to to work with me in some way? This is a great question. One, you're going to want to find creators that at least share something in common with you. You're not going to go out and find a fitness creator if you're a Magic the Gathering channel, unless you're a sure fitness me. Magic the Gathering player. Oh, <laughs> roar. Uh, definitely find people that share an interest with you and try and find people in general that are around the same size as well. Don't go shooting for the moon, right? Don't go asking for a collaboration with the top channel in the business because they're going to take one look at your channel and go, well, they've only uploaded two videos and they're okay. Why, is, why should I be giving them all this help? Why should I be promoting their stuff? Why should I be bringing them on? Are they, what are they really bringing for me? Because a collaboration is exactly that. And it may sound a little selfish, but at the end of the day, we all have to look after ourselves. So collaboration should be an opportunity for you to work with someone else and for them to work with you and for you to both grow as a result. Yeah, I think you can go slightly larger than what you are and that will be helpful to you. But I like what you said there, which is understand you shouldn't go asking for something so much as offering something. So mm -hmm. one thing to probably not do for a collaboration is try and be on their stuff. Ask them to be on your stuff. That's already offering something. If you know that they've got something going on, let's say that they've got a Kickstarter or they've got ah, good point. a new series that they've now launched, that's a time to go and be like, hey, I noticed you have this new thing you're doing. I'd love if you came onto my channel and promoted that thing. What did I just do? I just offered to help them with something rather than ask them for something. And they're going to be way more receptive in those moments to collabing with you. And they'll bring their audience that everything will happen. But now they're also, it's symbiotic. They're getting something from it too. Yeah. And that's a great opportunity as you, for you as well as a creator to make sure that the process is smooth and the process is good. You, the, the communication is clear. The boundaries are set. You know how long it's going to take. You set out a time. You give them the full expectation of what to expect. Like these are all really important things because, you know, the more that we do this, no one likes being blindsided and YouTubing and content creation is a relatively new thing in the history of content creating. So there's a lot of times where miscommunications can really lead to some salty results. And so you don't want that to happen. So lay out the groundwork, make sure you know what you're going to get and make sure you're prepared as well when the collaboration time comes. Collabs are great. They often lead to friendship. We're, like I said, we're friends with Prof. It started with him Clap. coming on to, onto our show yeah. uh, for an episode. And that's been beneficial to both sides. And we've done that with many people. You know, you might have a streamer onto your stream and later on down the road, they're going to raid you or they're going to yeah. talk about you in a lot of different ways. And so creating that network and by, and I'm not saying fake those connections, like Prof is a friend of ours. We're yeah. not just using him for his stuff, but we never would have met him if we hadn't collabed and been able to create that friendship. Yeah. And Prof got to where he was through collaborations as well. All of us many, many done creators. It. Yeah, yeah. And, and we understand what the, the game is all about and how it works. So no one here is going to be like, oh, they just want to use me for my views. It's more like, oh, this person has a great idea. That so sounds I fun. Promote something. Yeah, that sounds fun. This is awesome. Uh, another way to promote your stuff. Ob this is obvious, right? But there's a catch. So social media, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, 
Facebook, whatever you have or want to, don't do them all. It's going to be a lot to do them all. For a long time, we just had Twitter, basically. Yeah. We've branched out recently. We do Facebook and Instagram a little bit more. You touch Reddit a little I bit. I never to, go there. I used to be the one to post on Reddit yeah. to, to start the conversation. and realize, you know what? They're going to do the work for me. I don't need to involve myself. So here's the thing I think about all the social media platforms is that you have to look at it as a marathon. You're going to lay a lot of groundwork before you can use them as a promoting yeah. device. So you have to join the community that you're going to be in, become part of it. And then slowly after you've been part of it as a while, for a while, you've been involved in the discussions, you're not talking about your content that entire time, then eventually you'll be able to say, hey, I made something, you guys might want to check it out. If you just walk into a room and be like, I'm here, love me. <laughs> that's just not going to work very well. Now, if you walk into a room and you enter into a conversation, they're talking about a movie and you're like, I like movies. And, you know, talk you about hop that in, you bit. offer a good take, you, yeah. and you contribute to a conversation, you're not there to derail or have your own like, this is X bad, this is awful because of this. You know, People are generally going to like the comment, reply to you, respond to you, think, oh, this is cool, this is a generally positive conversation that's happening right now and then that's how you might get a follower that's how you know a great way to do this and the great way to game the system is find popular tweets from the creators that you do respect and reply to them with your own take don't don't get too crazy and be like i have to formulate the perfect response but when someone clicks on the popular tweet they'll see the replies under it and people will get likes people will get attention paid to them and then those people might follow you and realize oh cool look at all the other stuff this person posts they had a fun meme about magic the other day or they posted their tournament results i'm interested in the standard format and they Posted the deck list that is brand new, you know, so that's how you capture someone in. You have to open the funnel as big as possible and whoever ends up following all the way down to the bottom and becomes a new follower is much more worth it than just going somewhere and spamming for it. I will say that like we have people on Twitter that have just been with us for so long, you know, the uh, Eric Landis's of the world yeah. and the Jake Travers and the Russes and the, there's a bunch of you. I'm sorry. I didn't mention everybody. Um, I even know they're like rogue artists. I can just name them. Yep, you know, like exactly. Latris. They've been with I know us for their names. so long. If they said, Hey guys, I started a thing or I've got a thing. I would be like, I would retweet it. I'd be like, hey, everyone should look at this thing because they're friends of ours because they've been in the community for so long. And yeah. so that's a way for you to create a good way for you to promote your stuff. But you have to take it as a marathon and not a sprint. Don't jump into the rooms, you know, push the doors open and be like, I'm here, everybody. Watch <laughs> my stuff. That's just going to turn everybody off. And people are going to naturally be wary as well, you know, just because it, it this happened before. And we've seen the, the kinds of, you know, unfortunately, the idea of becoming an influential person or making content for a lot of people can attract a negative type of personality as well, the kind of person that just wants clickbait or just wants controversy or just wants to say things and rile people up. And, you know, if we're trying to create and foster a positive environment, we're going to naturally shy away from those people as well. Um, and another way to, like, interact with us, for example, is through our Patreon, because it means that, you know, you are part of our community and that you are joining our community in a way that supports us, and we appreciate that, and we're more willing to listen. And it's not like a pay-to-win kind of thing. That's not what it is. It's more like it's effort and it's time and it's and you know i know so many people in our discord now that's been moderated by our great mods and they create awesome channels and it's awesome to see it work in a way that's not solely based around having to interact with us but they come into the community they now they have friends that can help them with decks they have if they're creating content and stuff they have people that they might be able to ask to help partner up with them so like they're entering into another community and growing in it and then using it after that not immediately all right um the next point is timing is important so i see this a lot I got a message a few months ago from a podcast that was starting out and they were like talking about marketing and I was like, looked them up on iTunes and I was like, you got two episodes. <laughs> you don't want to market right now because if it works, you just failed because they're going to go and be like, uh, yep, that was a good episode, but they've got two things. What you want is your marketing works. They look and they go, wow, there's this big backlog. I'm hitting subscribe. I'm listening to all this stuff. Yeah. And I can't wait for I'm more. I'm going through. I'm looking for the episodes. That's what happened for me in limited resources. Like these are the episodes I want to listen. I downloaded those and just listen to those because they had such a big backlog. Yeah. So you want to wait until uh, you're a little ways in to begin the marketing process. Don't try and do it right from the start. All right. Let's talk about some specific stuff that I think people can just pay more attention to, do better, and will have the effect of getting more people to watch your stuff, which is really what promoting mm -hmm. it, the goal of it is. So better titles think about what you call your video your podcast think about 
you know they're messaging your copy yeah what how are you describing it in one sentence or less how are you going to tweet about it as opposed to how are you going to post on instagram about it is instagram the right place to promote it maybe not maybe twitter and facebook's better maybe you need to use your community tab on youtube more how are you going to get the messaging out there with both your title and the words you're putting behind it so for instance this episode we have a lot of different things we could call it the easy thing would be like advice for content creators that's going to do okay. Yeah. Some people are going to clip on, click on that. What about if we called it Dear Content Creators? Oh, personal. Some, are they talking to me? I'm a content creator. Right. Also, there's a little implication that maybe it's some kind of rant against other content creators. Uh, Negativity yeah. or the possibility of it is a draw. Yep. Even if it's not what you're going for. Again, the, the idea of clickbait is to still make sure that what you're saying is correct and uh, points to, to the, do with the, the topic, episode. Yeah. But mostly it's... We, there's so much content um, out there. Just draw the person and you want to have them at least start listening to it. You notice we didn't even sing at the beginning of this episode right. because we know a lot of people might be seeing this that are not magic creators and, or people that know the podcast. So if we came in and we started singing something, they might just tune out before we even get to the important point, thing. Yeah. So the very first thing we do in this episode to make sure it works and hopefully it works, uh, is to tell them, hey, this is what this episode's about. So if you're a brand new viewer, you saw the Dear Content Creators or whatever uh, episode title we end up going with and think, oh, this is interesting. I want to see what it's about. Dear content creators is pretty good, but what if we went with, uh, this is one you threw out, content creator secrets. Yeah, or top 10 things every content creator must know. There's a lot you need to do, but we're going to think about our title. We're not just going to type out the first thing. We're going to spend some time on it, and I think you all should too if you want people to watch your stuff. Yeah. Another thing is, and this is YouTube uh, specific or mostly, is better thumbnails. Think about your thumbnails. They should encapsulate your title, but they should also be a draw that makes people want to click on them. And you also have to understand kind of how YouTube works, which is it recommends your video in sort of a sidebar, either after another video or where you go to that main page. So you want your thumbnail to pop out in a way that makes someone want to click on it. I think the number one mistake I see along these lines from other creators, or I'm going to call it a mistake because I think it is, but maybe it's not, um, is all their thumbnails look very similar. Yeah. So what happens is a person might have wanted to watch that thing you made, but they think they already did because it looks like the thumbnail for the thing they did watch. Or, but it's not the same. But yeah. you just put your, you know, you like you have a series and it's called like Amazing Deck Brews. And you put Amazing Deck Brews in text in the middle and it's always blue with Amazing Deck Brews in the middle. And, there's and the no, title is Amazing Deck Brews. Yeah. So you can't even see what the deck is that you're brewing. Yeah. And so it's like, well, I already watched Amazing Deck Brews and that just looks the same as the last one I watched. Or even worse, someone looks at your thumbnail and then their eye goes to another one first because it's catchier and has more to it. And we're not saying, you know, do things that look crazy or whatever. Whatever, but make them pop a little bit and on, go around YouTube and look up your favorite content creators across every spectrum. Go to vloggers, go to beauty people and see what they do and see what works and you see know, what you're naturally drawn to. There have, there have been tons of articles written about this too. You know who's really, really good at it? Because science, Kyle Hill. They definitely have a style. Yeah. All his thumbnails look like they're his thumbnails or his show's thumbnails. They're all in the same world, but they don't look the same. You never mistake one for the other. They definitely stand out individually. One of the things we like to do when we design are designing a thumbnail is open up our page get our videos uh click on the videos tab so that all our thumbnails are sort of shown there in a line and just be like what does the last few look like oh that one was yellow maybe we don't use a yellow background for mm -hmm. this one. Oh, that one said how to let's not title it how to oh this one has you know our faces plus photoshop badly onto the faces of something else let's do something different for this one we can't do the same things all the time we don't want it to look the same from video to video it's also more fun right like yeah. i know ashlyn has a blast making these thumbnails sometimes uh, i would also look up corridor digital they make really good thumbnails and they have all sorts of different series on their main channel and their vlog channels uh, you kind of already touched on this but spend some time on your show notes on your show descriptions spend time on your reddit post about your your video or whatever that you're going to promote spend time on your tweet about it yeah and Get know that right. your twitter is different than the other formats you only have certain characters maybe you want to upload an image as opposed to just a straight link how are you going to get people to click that link are you going to tag other people in it are you going to start a conversation from the tweet there's so many different roads you can take every single time you tweet out something and this honestly is something that we you know at this point we're not like putting tons and tons of effort into it but we're certainly not putting no effort into it I mean, every time we post something, I write the tweet and then I write the Patreon post and then I write the Facebook post and then, you know, and the show description. And it's, you're right. It's different slightly for each platform, the way you tag people. There are hashtags on Twitter. You don't want hashtags on your Facebook post. Yeah. So you have to think about all that stuff. Spend some time. It doesn't take 
a long time, like you said, and especially once you've done it a while, you kind of know the slight changes you need to make for each thing, but spend time on it. You spend so much time on your content and then a lot of people don't spend any time on their thumbnail, their title, or their show description. You need that stuff. There's a lot of- That's the first thing people see when they click on your video. You may have spent 20 plus hours on a single video, but if you spend half an hour on all those other parts, then your great work is going to waste. Yeah. 100%. There's definitely podcasts out there. They don't title their episodes and they don't- like describe what it's about and there's a lot of them where it's like i would listen to that show sometimes because sometimes they talk about stuff that i like but i just never know from episode to episode if it's going to be something i want and the opportunity cost is just too high i'll just go to a show i know is going to i'm going to enjoy also like don't be afraid to break the rules and see if it works yes like you don't need to always title your podcast like for instance what if every one of our episodes was called the command zone podcast colon how to brew a deck (laughs) it's like okay that you're one that's taking up tons of the title in the beginning you don't need to necessarily put all that data in there in the beginning sometimes you can change it up sometimes you could i've seen some of the most successful videos just say i'm sorry right the yeah. classic apology video yeah. in no caps no punctuation and that's that stands out because otherwise you're seeing all caps like oh my god we just blew through a house with a car you know like stuff like that and it's it's sometimes it's better to change up the game a little bit i really like what you said there and it's permeating everything we're saying as far as like practice try stuff experiment if you've plateaued you're you know feeling like your channel's not growing like it was then you're in a situation where you should try new stuff yeah all right. uh, some of those things you can try are giveaways. Oh, this uh, is another thing I think we've had success with. Yeah, and it's it's a this is actually a really tough road to travel because if you were just like every single episode, I'm going to give away this. I'm going to do this and give it away. You're going to attract the wrong kind of person to your channel. The people that when you look at their Twitter and every single time we do giveaways for game nights, there's always hundreds and hundreds of people that do this. Every single tweet that they have is a retweet of like retweet this to win this. And they just, just created a Twitter account to enter just contest. to enter a contest, yeah. right? And that person is not really the kind of fan or support supporter you may be looking for because they're not going to contribute to you in a way outside of just a like on a video or a view you want to find the people you want to do giveaways again after you've built some road in front of you so that you have an audience that wants to do it and thinks oh this is cool now i'm supporting something i like yeah for and sure. i could win something but once you've kind of met those criteria i do believe giveaways can be beneficial they can work well they can promote your channel the way we like to do them and i think it was successful or still is is you want to have the giveaway relate to a behavior that you want to incentivize out of your audience so we like to encourage them to help promote our stuff so retweet about it or share the video we also gave away um, stuff early on for just reviews on iTunes. We didn't tell you you had to give us five stars or anything. We even said, give the star rating you think that we deserve. (laughs) But But just give us ratings. And we have like 1,500 ratings on iTunes, which is a lot and matters to the iTunes algorithm when it's recommending things or where it's going to place you on the page. Uh, And so you can incentivize the type of behavior you want and get sort of a a grassroots campaign going among your listeners. Yeah. You know, again, these are people that are already listening to your stuff and they're going to maybe win some stuff is gravy but you're also telling them like here's some stuff if you like the show that can help us out that we'd like you to do and they're happy to do it you just have to tell them what to do yeah yeah you'll be amazed what happens if you give just someone a little push in the right direction all right the last thing i would say is i wouldn't waste any money on direct advertising a lot of people ask about that do would you play for traditional advertising or facebook ads or whatnot i'm not saying there's no place for that and you're never going to do it because once you get to a certain size maybe that's a good idea but in general when you're in this middling area where just spend that money on your content yeah make your stuff better get a better camera whatever it is hire a sound person you know or or just buy things do things better invest more into what you're doing maybe you need a plug-in for a special effect on after effects that's going to pay way more dividends than advertising will for you yeah also if you're like a magic career and making niche content sometimes it's harder to do direct advertising effectively sometimes it's better just to get like a retweet from someone that really likes your content all right but seriously stop worrying about it Do the easy stuff that we've said, of course, but save your energy for your content. Stop worrying so much about growing your audience. Worry more about growing your skills as a content creator. Grow yourself. Yeah. (laughs) But I really do think a lot of people are, they're just putting the wrong priorities on stuff. Like 100%. uh, It's almost like I'd rather have somebody watch my stuff than have them like my stuff when they Mm -hmm. do watch it. I would much rather somebody, less people watch, but every person that watches thinks it's awesome. If you're super serious about making content and you want to be a content creator or a video maker, director, whatever it is, go look at some interviews with all the, the best people out there. They didn't get into it for the fame and glory. They got into it because they truly loved what they were doing. And you'll find that if that's the route that gets you into the content, you're going to have a much better time throughout and you're going to learn a lot more as a result too. 
All right. So the next point, I realize, I'm realizing this is going to be a long episode, but that's yeah. cool. You know what? Dear content creators, top 10 <laughs> secrets. We had to get through all of them. There's so many. <laughs> we don't get to talk about content creation that much, so we had to cram a lot in. All right. The next question we get a lot is, how do you even go about constantly improving your content? How do you resist complacency? How do you look at stuff with your own stuff with fresh eyes? How do you even know what you can or need to improve. Yeah, so, this, this first one's great. So we talk about all the time how we're just constantly trying to improve our content. We want every video, every, especially Game Nights episode to have some stuff, tangible stuff that you could notice if you looked that is better than the last video. And we're just slowly brick by brick making it better and better. And uh, this is an interesting, interesting question that we received a lot. And I, it kind of took me by surprise, but totally makes sense because we've been doing this professionally for a long time. So we see all the cracks and things we want to fix, but a lot of people, they do a thing and they're like, I'd love to make it better. I don't know what the problems are mm -hmm. or how to make it better. So, um, yeah, this first one is one of my favorites, which is just take short breaks. Yeah, give, don't get tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is one of the worst things to happen for someone that's in the creative field. Yeah, just, um, you can do something quick. I, I'm, I'm not talking like day or week long breaks, 15 minutes, 10 minutes can do it. Just you want something that takes your attention away. So you can read an article, you can play a game of foosball, you can run an errands, listen to some music for a little while, anything that just takes your attention away. And now when I go back and look at the thing I was working on, Fresh oh, eyes. all of a sudden I noticed something that I didn't notice before because I was too in it before. Yeah, it's like the aha moment in the shower. Uh, yeah. And I find I have a lot of those moments when I'm out of the office, back at home by myself, even just like drifting off to sleep going, wait a minute, that's what we could do. You know, and, th and those moments of clarity only come when you're able to clear your brain a little bit of what you were doing just a moment ago. Because it is really easy to just sort of get iron focused and laser focused on something. I have a note. I use the notepad on my phone constantly for those moments. They come to me and I just jot it down really quick. Yeah. I was at the gym working on this episode and stuff was just coming as I was like in between sets. Just, so I had like a document with like 500 words in it by the time I got done at the gym. And I was like, okay, great. Let's just put these in here. Yeah. And that's, you know, just be, be ready for that stuff. I do a lot of driving. So I use voice memos on my phone. It's relatively safe. I'm not like staring at my phone. I press a button, put it on my lap and drive and talk to my phone for a bit. And talking out loud is intimidating. But guess what? No one can see you because you're driving. <laughs> they think you're just singing along to a song. Yeah. A weird <laughs> song about Magic the Gathering. Uh, another good technique is to bounce between two projects. So have two projects that are on the front burner and what happens is when you're working on one project and you get sort of you get blocked or you hit a wall or you're not sure what to do now you just move over to the other project work on that for a little bit and that serves as your attention being taken away from the right. other one and now when you switch back you get fresh eyes on the on the first thing yeah there's so many counter lessons you can learn from your own projects and other things uh which is the next point so just watch consume content if you're a content creator and you're not if, for instance if you're a movie maker and you're not watching movies that would question what exactly is happening there if you're yeah. a magic player and you're not playing other board games for instance or even listening to reviews of board games watching gameplay videos online watching a D, &D stream then those are all things with people that are professional professionals and know what they're doing and doing it well that you can learn and glean information from like you can always be learning in this life and that's a huge part of being a better content creator over time all the time i'm listening to a podcast watching a show and i'm not even subconsciously doing this i'm consciously doing it i'm writing down what do i like about it what works about it what clicks yeah and then thinking about it later too right yeah. not just writing it down stopping being going back to it and being like yeah i really like that episode of this show because they did this which they had never done before and it was so different and cool and it really brought me back into the show well how can you apply that to your own content right yeah, and a lot of times there's not a direct application, but if you think about it for a little while, you can draw a parallel that will help you make a decision. Be like, yeah. this is similar. I could do something similar. It's not exactly what they did, but it'll have a similar effect. And I did really enjoy myself while that was happening, and I think my audience will enjoy it if I do something similar. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way to sort of improve your content. Look at professional stuff. What are they doing? And try to incorporate some of the aspects of that. Um, I, said, I put down learn to pay close attention to the tuning fork in your head. Uh, or your gut instinct, I suppose, another way of putting it. And and it's not something that necessarily happens quickly. A tuning fork has this idea where you go bing, and then you just know if, you're on t if it's tuned or not. But what I mean is sometimes I'll be working on something and I will watch it five times, 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. And on the 20th time, I'll be like, you know what? That one part has bugged me Almost every time yeah. I've watched it. I don't know what's wrong with that one part. Something's wrong with it, though, I know, because 
it's just the data has piled up to the point where I can't ignore it. <laughs> Definitely something's wrong. So I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to redo it. or I'm going to try and figure out what the heck is going on there because every time it's glitched, it, you know, my brain has glitched during that one little part. You're going to reduke it. Yeah. And that tuning fork just went off and said, nope, that part's out of tune. Yeah. That, that is great. Uh, I think that helps a lot too. If you show it to someone else and you're, you know, Oh, that's actually really good advice. There's this amazing thing that happens when you take your thing and you sit in the same room with a couple other people that are watching it for and the first you time. You watch them and you watch it and you watch them watching it. Almost. I'm getting goosebumps because there's this weird thing that happens where they almost don't have to say anything. You know, exactly. You're like, you were bored during this part. Yeah. You can feel the energy dip and wait. Really if you're really, especially if you really know what you're watching, like if you've seen it 20 times, you know exactly what's going to happen at every moment. There's no surprises there, but you can understand someone might take a glance at their phone or fidget. Yeah. Fidget. The best thing is that someone gets a text when they're watching something and they don't even look at their phone. You yeah. know, they're invested, you know, it's working, you know, jokes like, Oh, that joke played really well. This one didn't, I thought it was going to be the reverse. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, that's, that's a really good piece of advice. Um, from video to video or podcast to podcast, just always improve something. Just say this next video, whatever it is, pick something. Be like, I'm going to just slightly improve my graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, my sound's going to be a little bit better. Uh, something I noticed that's annoying about podcasts in general and we're trying to fix for ours is I hate it when I'm listening to a podcast and then I, it's over or it stops for whatever reason. And the radio comes on and blows my eardrums out because <laughs> the podcast was at such a low volume. Something that I don't want our podcast to do. So that's something we're working on right now. Yeah. And it's a small thing and it comes out of personal experience. Uh, and it may be something that no one ever even notices because maybe you only play us through YouTube or whatever. But it's something that we pay attention to. And it's just something that has paid, you know, brought itself up over time. And that's one improvement. And then once we get that down, we'll move on to something else. Yeah. Like we recently finally just really did a massive audio improvement recently and it was as simple as buying an app yep and that was all it took and tweaking the settings and testing it out and all of a sudden the audio sounds much better we're 250 episodes in <laughs> and yeah and we were like you know what we should actually address this in a way that you know makes sense and really does something and, and boom look at that what's funny about that is not a single person was saying to us for the previous 250 episodes hey your audio sucks yeah there well, are a couple we people were, were like, you guys could improve it. I'm an yeah. experienced audio, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah, maybe later. And <laughs> later came and we said, yeah, we just because no one's saying it's bad doesn't mean it can't be better. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love this next point. Play to your strengths and asking yourself what your competitive advantage is. So if you were a long distance runner, you're not going to go run the 100 meter dash anytime soon because that's not what you know. Uh, if you are a magic player and you have pro tour experience, that's something that you have that is unique to you and very few other people have. And that's something that you can talk about and people will want to listen because it's not a common viewpoint or one that they get access to normally. Yeah. For, we're going to refer to magic here for just a second. If you're a good deck brewer, that might be your competitive advantage, your strength. Maybe mm -hmm. your content itself, your concept is fast and relatively easy to produce. That might give you advantages. You can really respond when trends or currents happen or breaking news yeah, happens. Get right I can get it. a video out faster than anybody because my concept is easy to do. And so I can be current. Yeah. That's an advantage you can have. I understand the business of magic. Maybe I'm not a great player, but I understand the business side or I understand yeah. business in general. I'm a finance guy. I understand the statistics. I'm going to start a website called EDH Rec. That is now these, one of the single most popular websites in the world because my expertise has led me to be able to analyze and grab, gather this data because I knew no one else could before me. Donald Miner, who created EDH Rec. Yes. Uh, he looked and said, what's my competitive advantage? It's data analytics and did that. Yeah. Um, Mar, my friend ProZD yep. is an incredible example of someone that is making content that is fast and easy to produce. He gets hundreds of thousands of millions of views on f ones that he films like this with his selfie camera. Why? Because he's funny. He understands the trends. He's a deep down gamer and he knows how to respond to events quickly and in a timely way that is current and trending. And it's because he spends a lot of time on Twitter, a lot of time on the internet. He understands the dynamics and so he plays to his strengths. Also, one of his strengths is he has a great voice and yes. he uses that in his content as well. Your strength might be, hey, I'm funny. Mm-hmm then create funny content. Don't try and create serious content. And that sounds nuts. Like who wouldn't know that? But all the time you see people and you're just thinking, that's not your strength. Your strength is something else. And if you just leaned into that, you would be more successful. Yeah. What is your competitive advantage? Play to your strengths. And there's nothing wrong with playing to your strengths either. I know a lot of people are like, you know, a lot of 
directors are always like, I want to direct something serious and whatever. It's like, but you are a funny, amazing person. And honestly, the best, for instance, someone like Jim Carrey, my favorite performance of his is when he was able to subdue it and tone it down a little bit. But that doesn't mean that he shouldn't have done all of the comedy he did beforehand. Yeah, hilarious. <laughs> yeah, like it got him to the point where he was able to have that freedom to do that. So know that if you really want to do something down the line, your time will come. You just need to make sure that you're fostering your abilities to do so. Making a comedy movie, people consider it sometimes harder than drama. So if you're doing something that's harder and harder and harder and you're going to eventually do something that people consider easier, then maybe you're going to have a better time doing it. Jimmy, be serious. No thanks. Act serious. I can't. No, seriously, do Okay, it. fine. Okay, so next up, we are going to be Okay, talking. now be funny. All right, let's move on quickly away from that seriousness <laughs> <laughs> as fast as we can because I felt like I was dying on the inside. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, so this is all, playing to your strength, I think, is related to branding, which is a question people talk about a lot. You should yeah. think about your branding, but in general, when you're starting out or just in the middle, you don't have to worry about too much, but you should think of, a, I think this branding stuff is actually related to playing to your strengths and that. Let's think about this question. Okay. Quality versus quantity. Mm-hmm. Here's the funny thing. Everyone out there and all this stuff I listen to, all this crap, this MLM talk about like the other tips and tricks, everybody says quality, go after quality. And this is going to sound funny for us to say because our brand is definitely quality here at the command zone because what are we doing? We're playing to our strength. What is one of our strengths? We're on the professional side of content creation. We've worked... Jimmy's going to be in a Disney movie. I've worked on Disney movies. It doesn't get bigger than that. We know the professional side. However, there's a big advantage to quantity. Mm -hmm. And early on, I would say quantity is actually more advantageous to almost everybody out there than quality is. Because think of it like the person walking into the weight room. It's going to be way better for them to go into that weight room and do do it a lot than it is to them to work out really hard less times. Right. Right? Get in there, do it a lot because... If you're doing a sport, it's all about reps. Like, you don't go play one round of golf and be like, I'm going to be on the PGA Tour. No, you hit, you go hit golf balls every day. Yeah. And so I really do think I'm going to just contradict what most people are saying out there. I think early on, quantity is going to help you out a lot more than quality. doesn't mean you can't switch later. Well, quantity is also going to make sure that you get to make quality. Because you're getting the hours in, right? And you're like... Re- you're learning. If you Again, if you go back to our first podcast, we're professionals, but we still had quality issues all the way through the beginning but we did it in mind of like well we just keep grinding it out let's keep making episodes and keep coming up with things getting better guests etc cetera, etc cetera. and the quantity turned into quality at the the pace of the quantity if that makes sense if you did quality and it's like i'm gonna release a video once every three months it's like that's great if you have a built-in audience that knows to expect that but if you're trying to start out and show people and create a backlog of stuff you're better off making a lot more content because it also means you're working more and grinding more and learning a lot more in the process I wouldn't say that going the quality route is necessarily wrong either. I just don't want it to be like the one is all always all. right. Yeah, right? Yeah. Look at uh, Sam from Ristic Studies who puts out videos very rarely, but they're awesome every time they come out. He's very successful on YouTube, has a lot of subs, gets a lot of views. Uh, it took him a little while to build that, but you can definitely go that route. Play to your strengths. Mm-hmm. That's the big point here. Quality is not necessarily better than quantity. There's other things I wrote down. Uh, entertaining versus informative. Serious versus comedic. Professional mm-hmm. versus amateur. Organized versus off the cuff. Uh, and not all of these are either or, right? And not all of them are just two choices. You could be outrageous rather than comedic or informative mm-hmm. uh, or some mix of multiple things outrageous and comedic yeah right you can play to your again it's playing to your strengths you can even be outrageous and serious you know a lot of political punditry is basically that yeah uh so just know what your strengths are learn what they are if you don't know them play towards them lean into them your strengths are your strengths for a reason that's what you're good at and then that's going to make your content better yeah all right it's your fuel tank so once you Identify your strengths that's going to seep into everything. Your content, your Twitter posts, your thumbnails. Make sure you know what your strengths are. Identify them. That's your brand now. That's yeah. what you're you're leaning into it with everything. That gives you real focus and purpose, too. I really like that about... One of your strengths might just be that you have a very entertaining looking face. Which it should we've be... We've learned a face is smiling on thumbnails. There's a ton of data just suggesting that that is compelling to people. Yeah. Or if, you're fa- if you have a genuine face of like anger, a shock, or whatever, you see this on thumbnails all the time. Put your face on the thumbnail if that's one of your strengths. It will help. Yep. If, if you don't, if you're an emotionless person, uh, maybe not. But <laughs> and if the content you're making doesn't reflect, like for instance, if you're like outraged in the thumbnail and it's just a very serious podcast, you don't want that either. Make sure again it reflects who you are, your brand, your personality, and all that. Um, okay, so one last point I put under this is a lot of content out there 
kind of feels flat. There's no there there. Remember, emotion is the soul of entertainment. Think about your audience. When they watch your stuff, what's in it for them? What do they get? Mm -hmm. That's one way you can go about improving your content is thinking about your audience, what they're getting from it. They're getting laughs. They're getting emotion. They're getting invested. knowledge about the pro tour and how to be a better bodybuilder, whatever it is. Yep. All right. Expanding your horizons. All right. So here's an interesting question that we got quite a few times. When you have multiple ideas, how do you decide which ones to move forward with? Uh, choice paralysis. Yeah. That's a good one. It's And, uh, you know, you're in the situation, well, if I go this one, this has these upsides, but then I'm missing out on this other idea because I can't, t- can't do both and this has those upsides. And, you know, uh, this one's going to be on the cutting edge of what's popular right now, but this one is something that I'm really passionate about and might be cooler. And, oh my gosh, what do I do? It's a tough question. Yeah, it's a tough question. And the answer will always change based on where you are in your career, what you're doing now. Like, for instance, Josh and I would give you a different answer than we would have maybe six months ago sure. or before Game Nights came out, as opposed to after Game Nights came out. So it's definitely something that you have to learn how to weigh your options. And there's a bunch of different things to consider. Um, but at the end of the day, I still think you should just trust your gut because <laughs> it will rarely lead you astray, especially if your gut instinct has been refined by doing this quantity wise for a long period of time. Uh we say this a lot in regards to magic and it's true here. It's more art than science. I like mm-hmm. weighing variables. It's going to be different, different for each person. Here's some of the stuff that we might think about, uh, of the ideas that I have on the table that are possible here, which one's the fastest or the easiest to do, which one am I most excited about? How much does each individual idea cost in time mm-hmm. and money? Um, what will be the most relevant at the time it's complete? Great so question. let's say that one of our ideas was something related to star Wars um, oh, if we start it right now, could it come out By the about the, the same movie? time the movie comes out? Or is it going to come out four months after the movie in a dead zone between Star Wars movies? Maybe we don't do that idea. Or maybe we do and we don't care, but it's something we would think about. Right. I think the most important questions to ask are, which idea do you have the actual means to execute? So do you have the time, money, and expertise to pull it off? If the answer to that question is yes, then it's still there. It's still a possibility. And then which one do you think will be the coolest? Yeah, and make you the happiest too. And usually those go hand in hand, I think. Another cool trick I learned is um, grab a coin. If you're down to two choices, it doesn't work if there's three, obviously, because a coin only has it. Oh, I like this one a lot. Grab a coin. Say, if it's heads, it's this, it's this idea. If it's tails, it's this one. Flip the coin while the coin's in the air. You'll know which one you want which one you're land. rooting for yeah if you're like boy i hope it's tails then do the one that's <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's good that's a good point you do often know right it's never a buried in there it's somewhere. never a full 50 50 split right it's it's there all right here's another controversial one or maybe it's not i'm interested to hear what you think how much yeah. does consistency matter how far ahead should you produce content to avoid missing weekly or scheduled posts or how hard should you basically try not to miss scheduled or weeklies post this is something again all the mlm speaking people out there all that content i watched they just hit it over and over you got to be consistent you got to be consistent. consistent you got to be consistent 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 and i think this gets into the heads of established content creators and they miss a week or they their their lives get busy and they they miss and then they just fall completely off the wagon because i'm not consistent now i'm never going to be consistent why <laughs> am i even doing content well i mean you see the stories of ninja saying he didn't stream for two days and lost x number of subscribers thousands and thousands tens of thousands of subscribers and it's like holy crap if i'm a streamer doesn't mean i have to go every single day no matter what it's like well, if you're Ninja, maybe. But even also, then, Ninja's even fine. Then, he's fine. <laughs> he lost those subscribers. He can gain them back. That's just how the economy of Twitch works. Right. And YouTube has an algorithm that makes that work in a specific way. Twitter, you could have the most popular Twitter of all time and only tweet once a week. Right? Just making sure that you're doing the right tweets or whatever yep. it is. So, like, it, it all really does vary. I think, again, if you're starting out, do what is doable and survivable for you. Because a lot of people are doing content creation as like a side job or whatever. Consistency is important in growing an audience and keeping that momentum going. Uh, But if you are connecting with your audience, if you are really good with your community, they'll understand if you miss a week or something. They'll understand if you're not there. But if you start doing a bunch of weeks in a row and all of a sudden they don't even know when the video is coming out, or if a video is coming out at all, then you're going to start losing a little bit of faith. And I think that's the main thing is that consistency really just matters to the audience that you're building. And it will matter for algorithms and all that stuff too. But honestly, like to make yourself the happiest and I think to make the most success out of what you're doing, your consistency should be what you can handle and what you think is realistic isn't the right word to throw around, but do what's not going to murder you in terms of workload. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a tendency at the start when you're making content to over, over guess, overestimate the amount of content you're going to be able to put out. Yeah. And sort of lock yourself in contractually, I'm putting that in quotes, in your mind to like, I got to produce this amount of videos. And then you get three months in, four months in, five months in, and you realize, uh, that's mm. a lot. I don't have time. It was fun and it still is fun, but I need some time in my life for other things. And then you go, but I can't stop because I have to be consistent. And so don't lock yourself in so hard to that. Maybe you did two videos a week and you go down to one, or maybe you did a video a week and now you're doing three videos a month. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly fine. I think we have tons of examples. Sam from Mystic Studies, who we just talked about, is a person who is pretty successful by basically every measure and just puts out a video whenever he's done with it. And sometimes there's months in between. And people are used to it from Sam now and nobody really blinks an eye about it. Whereas I think if Sam had went from one per week to suddenly all of a sudden I'm just doing it random now, that would be where you're in trouble. So I guess consistency really is consistent, but the problem is that all the chatter about it, they're not really meaning consistent in that keep to a schedule. They're meaning do it a lot. Do it a lot and don't stop doing it. You yeah. never want to get to the point where your consistency is stopping you from actually improving your content. Too. Yes. So if it's like, I got to put out another video this week, I don't have time to make it better. It's like, yeah. well, maybe you should think about what you're doing to make yourself better because there's no worse feeling than doing stuff for like a half year straight and putting out all this consistent content that's at a certain level and not growing. And yeah. maybe ask yourself why you're not growing as opposed to, well, I got to keep the schedule. You know, maybe it is important at that point to take a month off and really focus on what you're doing and how you're going to make it better and then hitting it with new energy and new drive afterwards. I love that because a lot of these people in this category, we hear from, you know, the established creators that have hit that plateau, have hit that wall, feel like they're not growing anymore. And they want to stick to the consistency because they tell you that's what's going to make you grow and not plateau. And Mm -hmm. it's like, that's actually the thing holding you back now because it's not giving you the time to improve in the areas that would help you get back on the growth path and get back to improving. So sometimes just try it. It's experiment, practice, say, I'm going to see what happens if instead of releasing, you know, two videos a week, I go down to one and that one's better yeah. than e- either the two videos were singly before. And it's going to be shared twice as much yeah. or just people are going to recognize it and like it because of the extra time and Carol's able to put into it. Maybe that's what your schedule is then, two weeks instead of one. Yeah, or maybe like, yeah, every other week I put out a video that's just a little bit better quality. Whatever the timing is, give it a shot. Try it out. Yeah. All right. One more question that we've heard quite a bit is how do you summon... Oh, yeah. This is probably the second biggest one or a variation on this question, which is how do you summon the time effort necessary to actually make the content? I don't know. Sometimes this is, I mean, it's going to be near and dear to both our hearts because eight years in Josh, (laughs) (laughs) this is a thing that basically a lot of questions boil down to like, it's hard to make myself do it. Yeah. It's so hard Yeah, because it's, it's work ethic, it's discipline. And these are things that, I'm not going to lie. In America, sometimes those are not real common ideals that are driven into kids' heads because it's about go have fun, be yourself, do what you want. And a lot of times that's not actually, if you really want to do what you want, you're going to have to practice two hours a day for 10 years straight. Right. <laughs> you're going to have to walk into the gym and lift the 20 pound weights and then the 25s and then the 30s. And you by the way, keep going. you can't, yeah. yeah, we're four months in now only. And like, yeah, yeah. yeah mental fortitude is going to be very important for your success as a content creator. Set goals set deadlines hold yourself accountable make sure you hit that stuff find it completely unacceptable not to find a business partner that will help you make sure you hit those get deadlines and goals and you guys will do it together find collaborators make sure that they're realistic but yeah i mean it's hard to tell somebody how to have the mental mentality necessary to push through when you're feeling like and we've all felt it and we will again and we will again and we will again and you will be pushing through it or dealing with it on our own and i maybe it helps to know that like you know by a lot of by most measures i would say we're pretty successful on youtube and we've had oh yeah we've done well and but we feel that all the time we feel that same thing that you do so the fact that we can push through it means you probably can too yeah um And I don't love referring to other corporate slogans, but there is one that is just all encapsulating and it's one of the best slogans of all time. Probably the best slogan of all time. Just do it. Yep. Just do it. You know, I trained extremely hard for Mulan and I continue to train uh, today. And one thing that constantly gets brought up is 
watch how fast you slipped off the consistency train the moment that you just let yourself do it. And it wasn't me. It wasn't anything. It wasn't anyone else, but you were the one, right? You were the one that decided, I'm going to be lazy today. And then that turned into, I'm going to be a little lazier tomorrow. And then it sort of like piled onto itself. And it's really easy. The point was for my trainers, it's really easy to let yourself get into these patterns if you're not being consciously active about it and, and, and talking to yourself and understanding where your brain is at. And it's a really scary thing too to look at yourself and be like, I'm being lazy. I'm not working as hard as I think I should. And of course, you can push that too far as well. But being truthful and honest to yourself and having those hard conversations is what's going to help you get the mental fortitude you need because... If you find that you are in a, uh, a straw house and the one big bad wolf can blow it down, well, maybe you need to learn how to build, build it out of wood or brick, right? Maybe that's what the lesson is. It isn't so much like, ah, I just couldn't do it, so I stopped. Maybe the lesson here, if you're a real content creator and you really want to pursue this as a dream is maybe I need to buckle up a little bit here and figure out how to make this work in a way that's healthy for me and also gets the content that I want to make out because that's going to make me ultimately happier. I think too, a lot of people are feeling not successful because they're comparing themselves to things that aren't equivalent to them, right? If yeah. you look at our channel and you say, I want to be what those guys are, well, you got to realize, A, Jimmy and I have been doing this stuff for a long time, and B, we're doing it full-time all the time. Yeah. Josh especially. Like, there's so many times where I'm like, hey, man, I can't do it this week. I got to do X, Y, and Z. And then he's like, all right, well, we'll do it Sunday afternoon. It's like, oh, that's a weekend. But for the fact that we got to get this out in time for the editors to get to it, to release on time for you all, we have to do it on this day. And it's not like a, oh, we got to do it like this. It's like, okay, this is just the realistic situation and what has to get done in order to get it done. But we hear a lot of people out there and they've got excuses and they're good ones. I have kids. Yeah. I have a demanding job. You know, I blah, 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 blah. That's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not that those aren't valid. Here's the thing. You can't compare yourself to us though, because we are doing this full time and you've got another job and you're doing it part time. What's realistic for you. You have to, you have to look in the mirror and understand what that is. Yeah. You got to ask yourself what you want to get out of all of this stuff too. If what your goal is, is to do YouTube full time, do streaming full time, eventually transition to that. Well, then you got to go to the gym every day and lift the small weights and then the medium weights until you get to the big weights. And that's when what Jimmy said is a hundred percent true. You, the excuses can't be there. You got to push through it. Yeah. If it's just a hobby and it's something that you're going to do for fun and maybe make a little bit of income off of, then that's okay. But don't compare yourself to the people that are doing it full time. Cause that's not apples to apples. That's not a fair comparison to you. It's not going to be, it's not going to, it's not going to help you sleep at night. Yeah. And my general life advice is that even if you are doing this part-time as a hobby, still push yourself. Oh yeah. Still find the, the moments where you are facing some adversity and don't back down. You know, I think that's a, a, an incredible growing moment for humans who are capable of learning till the day we die. You know, let these moments form you and make you stronger, right? Don't, don't, don't find, just try not to find convenient excuses all the time because you'll find that that behavior will bleed into your normal life and that's going to affect more than just your fun side project. All right, let's go through the common mistakes of established creators here. Uh, and this is related. I think a lot of you got into this and didn't ask yourself this question. And you should at this point now. What is your goal? What do you want to get out of this? Mm -hmm. Write it down. Put it on the wall. Every decision you make, does that help me with that thing? Or does it take me further away from it? Yeah. And set long-term goals. Don't go, you know, if you have a, a one-year goal, there's going to be a two, four, six, eight, ten 10 month, you know, like tiers to get up to it. But the longer you set your goal away, the better it is for you in terms of how you're going to achieve that goal. And actually, you know, again, asking yourself every time you do something, is this taking me closer to my goal or further away from it? And it's much more clear if that goal is down the line as opposed to right in front of you. I don't mean also like my goal is to hit 20,000 subscribers. That's a number. That's not a goal. That's not a goal. Yeah. My goal is to have fun. That will take so much pressure off. My goal is to turn this into a career. Both of those are valid. They're both fine, but they're totally different in what you need to do to accomplish both things. Right. And if you know and have written it down, okay, well, if I want to make this a career tonight, I got to create the content because I need to be getting my video out there and blah, blah, blah. But if I'm just doing this to have fun tonight, mm, it's not fun. I'm not doing it. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to make this a career. Okay, I need a sponsor. Okay, how does that work? Okay, cool. Now that I know that, I'm going to need to get my channel a little more popular, have this kind of engagement on before I think I can reasonably approach a sponsor. And that's a part of the goal of doing the career so that next time you're like, all right, I'm about to make this video. Does this help me get towards that or not? And then if it doesn't, then ask yourself, why am I doing it? And if it does get towards you, then great. Keep pursuing that path. Follow that thread. All right. Totally unrelated, but also important. Be on camera if possible. 
Yeah. It's, it, it's it, a creator world. <laughs> <laughs> also, people knowing what you look like pays you in dividends in weird ways down the line. Like, let's say uh, people in a certain community, say the magic community, are getting invited to events. Mm -hmm. And the company throwing the event is going to pay for the flight and the hotel for the people. And you want to be one of those people that gets invited. Guess what? If people generally know what you look like, you have a much better chance of being on that list than somebody who they only know what sounds like. Yeah, and that's what cosplaying helps out a bunch of for the, those people that go that route that want to get invited to conventions and stuff and get paid appearances, which they totally deserve, which is like your face and your appearance is your brand. And that's why they get invited to these things is because people can go and go, oh, I remember you. I've seen you before. That's such a great cosplay. You know, if you're just a voice on the radio, unless you're massively popular, it's going to be hard for people to get super excited about seeing you because they won't know what you look like. It's just, there's, and that's just one benefit. There are a lot of benefits. If possible, try to be on camera. Uh, for the editors out there, especially the people who have recently learned to edit, don't over edit. Mm -hmm. Listen to a lot of podcasts and videos where they've taken out every pause, every, breath. every, um, every breath. Here's the thing that can't happen in nature. A person cannot overlap with their own self. <laughs> so if you're listening and the end of my word the start of the next word starts to come in over the end of my last word. That's not possible. And the ear will catch it. Now, Jimmy can start to talk as I'm finishing my sentence. Yes, correct. But I can't start to talk as I'm finishing my sentence. Yeah, so don't over, over edit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. You hear it a lot where it's just like, come on, you got to put a little breath in there. It just sounds unnatural and it brings you out of it. Yep. Um, edit your music, everybody. Here's the thing. Don't let your music just fade away. Edit it so the music sounds like it stopped on purpose. This yeah, is, listen to like radio, right? Mm -hmm. Listen to a, an NPR podcast or a professional level podcast. They'll have little musical things where the music will come up and it'll end. And that'll all happen in five seconds, maybe six seconds. But it'll sound like the... It won't be like the music just played off into the distance and really faded away until you couldn't hear it. Like yeah. it, that just doesn't happen. Or the song will hit a part of a section where it's like a constant, like slow droning thing. And then they'll talk over it and then they'll play throughout the whole thing. Right. That's like the, the flavor of the segment too. Yeah, so. for sure. But that's the, di that's a difference between professional content. <laughs> and <amateur> content. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just have NPR music stuck <laughs> in my head now for video content. And this is for magic play. Oh yes. This is such a good point. Stop showing cards that have the little white corners listen, everybody out there, and I'm not going to talk to specific ones, but you know who you are. If you put a card on screen and in the corners, it's, there's that white stuff. The corner, yeah, the 90 degree angle. Because magic cards are curved. Yeah. And then if you don't have a PNG, you have like a JPEG file that's square. There's going to be that white stuff in the corner. Scryfall exists, people. It just gives it to you the way you need it. Also, Photoshop, if you had to, is very easy to just take out the white in the corners. Mm -hmm. Also, we used to just crop them so they had hard cur hard uh, angles on the where the curves would be just so there wasn't white. Just There's no reason to have that white in the corners. Just don't do that anymore. Yep. Everybody should stop doing that. Uh, all right. Last one. Yes. Don't, uh, don't put too much time and effort into analyzing your analytics if the sample size is small and there are so many other things that are going on that might affect it. Um, it's so easy to look at your analytics and be like, oh gosh, this is so bad. I only have so-and-so this and this and that and that. And it's like, well, that information, imagine if it, if you had 3,000 times the audience, how different that information might look because all of a sudden one person from Southern California versus 10 in New York it's that's 10 percent of my audience is this so that number may be completely different by the time your numbers get bigger also here's the thing that happens uh in september everybody's views just go down on everything school because school happens but the first time that happens to you you freak out because you're like holy crap all my videos all of a sudden it's basically an episode of the podcast that's not that different but it got you know sixty thousand views instead We're of a hundred thousand what happened nobody likes us anymore yeah there's cyclical things that happen and you don't have the sample size or the wherewithal right now to understand what that is spikes can go in the other direction where oh it's awesome i must be hitting home runs every time eh, maybe everybody's just going up at that time for some other reason yeah i'm not saying don't get excited when you're doing well and don't get a little bit sad when you're doing poorly but keep it in perspective don't go crazy about your analytics all right Final thought. Content creation is a long road and we're talking years yep. and years. We're here after five. Yeah. So. The people who are successful are really the ones who stick around. It's really the fitness parallel again and mm -hmm. again and again. The people, everybody out there and I know when people are looking for this stuff, I can tell because of what I found when I looked. Everybody wants that magazine that says six minute abs. <laughs> they want the, the hacks. 
They of want course. the tricks. It's they the want the digital age, yeah. Josh. I want any information in the world. I can get it in 10 seconds. Right. And it's going to make me into a star just as quickly. And that's not the reality because you would be crazy if you said, I am going to go play one round of golf and then become a professional. Mm -hmm. You'd be crazy if you said, I'm going to go to the gym for one week and I'm going to be a bodybuilder. Yeah. That is not how that works. And that's not how it works here. Work on your skills, work on your content, make it better every day. You'll get where you want to get. And one final thought from me is that when you start the process, and I can ask you this too, Josh, when we started five years ago, could you have, in your wildest, most detailed imagination, said where we would be five years later? Not even close. Not even close. Even if you were the most experienced content creator in the world, could you have You said were that? very experienced at the time. I had and, no idea. Exactly. So what that I mean, means... I would say, let's be real. At the time we started this, there's probably less than a thousand people on the planet who are more experienced with YouTube than you, right? <laughs> yeah, probably around that. And you still would never have guessed where we would be right now. Not even close. So Not how e could anybody out there who's just starting out, who no way they have the experience you have. Yep. And it's the same with bodybuilding or fitness or any of that stuff. When you start a journey, you just don't know what it's going to be like at the end of it until you get there because you're going to experience all of it throughout it. And that experience is what makes the journey the journey. So trying to start something and being like, I want, I know it's going to be like this, or I, this isn't what I dream of. Don't get too ahead of yourself. Really trust in the process, trust in where you're going to learn from it. And by the end of it, I guarantee you, one, you're not going to be able to predict how you, what happened and how you got there, but you're going to learn so much in the process that that is going to be invaluable, maybe for the rest of your life, maybe not even related to content creation. It can be a very fulfilling thing if you're able to approach it the right way. And we're not to the end yet. We're still in the middle of the journey. Journey before destination. It's all about the journey. Yes. All right. To the listeners. Have you ever thought about making content? Yeah. Did you do it? If yeah. so, how did it go? Is it still going? <laughs> are you, uh, are, did you stop? If so, either way, what happened? Yeah, Give us your story. Let us know. Let us know. Yeah. You can tweet at us. You can comment at us. Uh, if you're on our Discord, you can talk to us directly. Uh, yeah, just, just talk to us. Oh, I do want to say too, for those people that are here for Not Magic, found us in some other way. Usually we talk about Magic the Gathering, which means most of our content you're probably not interested in. However, we do have a couple of episodes that are on similar topics to this, and we'll link them in the show notes. Yep. Uh, if you like what you heard here, we might be able to help you out a little bit more. Uh, the creative process is one of our other ones yeah, that we're always one. telling people to. And if yeah. you're interested in magic or like games or card games at all you should also check out game nights that's nights with a k and let's say you do want to just jump into the magic the gathering game or just board games in general you thought it was so much fun you want to play with your friends head on over to our sponsor cardkingdom.com slash command zone just type in that link you it's our affiliate link you'll ex enter the exact same site and boom tons of options there card kingdom's got tons of stuff starter decks for magic players uh booster packs and singles for more indentured players and they also have tons of board games as well it's perfect for the holiday season if you're listening to it right now they got massively fast shipping uh, shipping can't be massive they've got incredibly fast shipping and it's something you don't want to miss out on <laughs> that's a huge thing at this time of year i when i order something i want to make sure it's going to get where i want it to get in time for the holidays yes so even if you're not here for magic you probably have a friend or a family member that's into gaming of some kind cardkingdom.com slash command zone best place to go to get that stuff really fast and our other sponsor is ultra pro all those games all that stuff you want to protect it you want to put it onto a nice play mat you want to put it into sweet deck boxes you want it to look as awesome as possible and you don't want it to get damaged ultra pro has the best stuff for both of those things all right moving on to the end step where we usually talk about something cool outside of the world of magic i think we're skipping it today because we talked to the for an hour and a half about things outside the world of magic as this went on we were both like looking at it's an hour oh, and a half now oh, hour it's an hour 40. Okay. here we go you got your money's worth today everybody but <laughs> if you do still want to hear more if you if you didn't get your magic fix for this week and uh, some yeah. people get upset and i apologize but you might want to head on over to our sister podcast the masters of modern alex kessler and ben bateman they talk about the modern format and all things competitive magic so they can fill in and give you your magic fix this week uh if you're really hankering for it you can find them on twitter at the memcast you can find them by just typing the masters of modern into youtube in the search bar there or any of your podcast apps yep our editing graphics team and logistics team it's Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Alfred Destaka, Terry Robertson, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, and Sam Waldo. The family continues to grow. It used to be just me and Josh <laughs> five years ago. If you showed me all of these names and said, they're going to be your team, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Team for what? <laughs> we work out of my apartment right now with mics that are old and crappy. They just happen to work. And it's of course, crazy. special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Card animations that are featured behind us on the set that we built. Another thing I never would have predicted we would have done as well as on our channel at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. Remember when we were like, should we open the YouTube channel? Nah. 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 
Body only is fine. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>